So imagine you are taking your organic chemistry exam and you have this question on the exam. Arrange the following molecules according to their acidity from the most acidic to the least acidic. Your hand reaches to the pKa table and what you see is a problem because this is a carboxylic acid and this is the carboxylic acid and the last molecule is also a carboxylic acid, but your pKa table only lists one carboxylic acid, one pKa for a carboxylic acid functional group. So what do you do in this case? Hello everyone, Victor is here and in this video I'm going to talk about the acidity trends and how we can rank our acids without the pKa table. So first of all, let's look at the typical acid-base reactions or a typical generic cases of the acid-base equilibrium. The first one, I'm going to call it type 1, is where we have our acid which is going to dissociate into H+, and our conjugate base, which I'm going to denote as A-. minus. In this case, what we're going to do, we're going to solely focus on the structure of our conjugate base, and we're going to assess the stability of said conjugate base, and we're going to do that using five different factors. There is also another type of acid-base reactions that you are sometimes going to be facing during your exams and homeworks, and that's the one where you have a positively charged starting material, so I'm going to call it HB+, which is going to dissociate into H+, and a neutral conjugate base B. Well, in this case, we would focus our attention on the stability of the starting material, and we are going to assess the stability of that starting material acid, just the same using five factors, the same factors that we use for our conjugate base in the first case. Since type 1 is a significantly more common type of a ranking that you are going to be facing in your class, in our video here I'm going to be solely focusing on type 1. However, type B can be assessed using the same five factors that you are going to be talking about, but for the most part you are going to be applying them in the opposite direction. So if something is good for type one, for the most part it's going to be bad for the type 2. Type 2 acidity is also something that we are going to heavily discuss once we start talking about amines and chemistry of amines, and since amines are basic, whenever amines are going to get protonated, they're going to form positively charged acids, and then we're going to review those trends one more time, but from a slightly different perspective. So as I've mentioned, we're going to talk about several factors that are going to determine the stability of our conjugate base. The first factor that I want to look at is the resonance. So let's look at the following two molecules. I have the acetic acid over here, and I have an ethanol molecule, like that. So, to assess whether one species is more stable than the other one, of course I can grab the pKa table, but what if my table is not available to me? So what I'm going to do in this case, I'm going to deprotonate each of those species and look at what type of a conjugate base I'm going to end up with. In the first case, that is going to be a deprotonated carboxylic acid, or in this case an acetate anion, and in the second case I'm going to have my alcoholate alkoxide anion like that. So, the important thing to notice here is that my acetate ion actually does have a resonance structure, so I can delocalize my negative charge over two different oxygens, and I'm going to have my second resonance structure looking like this. So now the acetate ion having a delocalized negative charge is actually going to be significantly more stable than a localized negative charge on the oxygen. So this charge is localized. And since delocalized electrons are more stable, we're going to say that our conjugate base on the left is more stable, more stable, and therefore the acidic acid is actually a stronger acid. And of course, if we were to uh, check our pKa values, we are going to end up with roughly 4.8 here versus roughly 16 for the uh, 
for the alcohol. One important point that I want to make here is that whenever you are analyzing your molecule from the resonance perspective, you always want to focus on the major resonance contributors first with the negative charge on electronegative elements like oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, etc. Mostly we are going to see examples with oxygen and sulfur as the most acidic ones. While having the minor resonance contributors is a cool factor and it's definitely going to influence the stability of your conjugate base, the minor resonance contributors are not going to bring as much stability as the major contributors. So you can have one additional major contributor and it is going to bring more stability than three or four additional minor contributors. So first, Always look at the major resonance contributors, and if there is no difference from the major contributor perspective, only then look at your minor contributors. The next factor is going to be the atomic size of atoms bearing our charge. And this is where we are going to look when we have atoms in different periods. So that's the comparison that we are going to do in between the periods. So for instance, let's say I have a molecule with an OH group, versus a molecule with, for instance, an SH group. Well, in this case, if I make my corresponding conjugate basis, then what I'm going to end up with is O minus on the left, and I'm going to end up with S minus on the right side. If I look at my periodic table, the oxygen atom, which is in the sixth period, is located above the sulfur atom, which means that the sulfur atom is larger. And because sulfur is larger, it will be able to stabilize the negative charge better, which means that my S minus anionic species here is more stable. That also means, by extension, that the molecule with SH, my thiol, is more acidic than the OH and alcohol. And if I were to compare the pK values, I am going to have roughly 11 for my thiol and about 16 for my alcohol, so 10 to the fifth power difference is quite significant, I would say. The next factor is going to be the electronegativity, and we're going to look at electronegativity when our atoms with a negative charge are located within the same period. At that point, the size difference is going to be insignificant, so electronegativity is going to be more important. For instance, let's say I have an alcohol over here versus and I mean nitrogen and oxygen, if we look at our periodic table, we have carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, so they are in the same period, and electronegativity increases as we go along the period to the right, which means that if I were to make my conjugate bases in this case, I'm going to end up with O- minus on the left side and NH minus on the right side. Since oxygen has a higher electronegativity than nitrogen, it's going to make a more stable conjugate base, and since it's a more stable conjugate base, we're also going to have a stronger acid that have produced it. So in this case, if I were to compare my pKa values, I'm going to have 16 for the alcohol and around 36 for my amine. That is quite a significant difference here. Now, important thing to keep in mind here, when it comes to the size versus the electronegativity, size will always trample electronegativity. Size is more important. So if, let's say, I look at sulfur versus oxygen, sulfur actually has a significantly lower electronegativity than oxygen. Sulfur's electronegativity is a hair above 2.5, while oxygen's electronegativity is nearly 3.5, yet sulfur, being a larger atom, can stabilize the negative charge better than oxygen, despite the fact that oxygen has a higher electronegativity. Next, our next factor, factor 4, is the inductive effect, or the presence of the electron withdrawing group. So that brings me to an example or the comparison similar to what my original question was, where I have, let's say, two carboxylic acids like this, in the first case I have a fluorine atom versus in the second case I don't have anything, I just have a pure carboxylic acid. Well, in this case, if I were to make my conjugate bases in each of those examples, I'm going to have the example with the carboxylic acid on the left containing the fluorine atom and the carboxylic acid on the right containing, well, nothing. 
And if I'm looking at the stabilization of my negative charge in these conjugate bases, in the first case, I do have resonance, but the molecule on the right, the anionic species on the right, well, that guy also has the same amount of resonance, which means that from the resonance perspective, there is no difference. The negative charge is located on the oxygen in each case, which means that there is no difference from the perspective of the atomic size, nor there is any difference from the perspective of the uh, electronegativity. Now, the next thing that I'm going to pay attention to is the inductive effect or the presence of said electronegativity groups or electron withdrawing groups. Fluorine, being an extremely electronegative element, is going to pull electron density towards itself, thus it's going to indirectly stabilize the negative charge on the carbonyl by slightly pulling the electron density towards itself throughout the chain. The important thing to keep in mind here is that the inductive effect is a relatively weak effect and it scales with the distance and the number of your electronegative groups. So if you have more electronegative groups and they are closer away to the place where the negative charge would be, they would show a stronger inductive effect and they would stabilize your molecule better. However, if you have less electronegative elements or electron withdrawing groups and they're further away from the place where your negative charge is, the effect of that electron withdrawing group is going to be very small and in many cases even negligible if the group is far away. The inductive effect typically completely dies out within uh, three to five atoms depending on the strength of the original effect to begin with. So in this case, my molecule with the fluorine is going to experience the inductive effect, which is going to make it more stable, and by extension, it makes my left carboxylic acid much stronger. If I were to look up the PKA values, I'm going to have roughly 4.6 on the right side, and somewhere around 3 on the left side. It was rather difficult to locate that specific one PKA value, so I had to approximate that. Finally, the last factor that we have is the hybridization of atoms with a negative charge. And here, generally, the negative charge on an sp hybridized atom is going to be more stable than a negative charge on an sp2 hybridized atom, which is going to be in turn more stable than a charge on an sp3 hybridized atom. A classic example that we typically show for something like that is going to be a, let's say, an example of a terminal alkyne like this versus just a regular alkene or even an alkane molecule to make it a little bit more drastic. So I will draw an alkane molecule. In this case, if I were to make the conjugate base for each of my species, I'm going to end up with CH3C triple bond C minus on the left, so it's an alkynyl anion, and I'm going to have my CH3, CH2, CH2 minus on the right side or alkyl anion. And since on the left side the carbon is sp hybridized versus an sp3 hybridized on the right, the left species, the alkynyl ion, is going to be more stable. Therefore, my original alkyne on the left is going to be more acidic, and if I were to compare my pKa values, the one on the left is roughly 25 to 26, while the pKa values for the alkane, they are estimated to be somewhere between 55 to 65, so purely experimentally unachievable astronomical numbers over here. So a quick recap. For your typical ranking of neutral compounds, follow the following factors assessing the stability of the negatively charged conjugate bases. The first factor that we talked about was the resonance. And as I've mentioned here, you have to focus on the major contributors and pretty much skip the minor ones. The next factor was the atomic size, where we looked at the atoms in between different periods. So that would be comparison when you have, let's say, oxygen versus sulfur, or nitrogen versus phosphorus, etc. Then we look at electronegativity. We only look at the electronegativity when we are comparing elements within the same period. So oxygen versus nitrogen, oxygen versus carbon, nitrogen versus, I don't know, fluorine, etc. Then we looked at the induction. 
or the presence of the electron withdrawing groups or the electron negative elements. Those ones should be as close to our negative charge as possible. The further the electron withdrawing group or the electronegative element is, the weaker its influence on the molecule is going to be, and after it's about five bonds or so away, its uh, presence is going to be pretty much not felt at all, it's going to be negligible. And finally, we have our hybridization, where we have the sp orbitals being more stable than sp two orbitals being more stable than sp3 orbitals. So when you are trying to pull the proton of something that is sp hybridized, it is going to be significantly more acidic than a similar proton that you are trying to pull off, let's say that something that is sp2 or sp3 hybridized. You may also have heard of the area model, which stands A, stands for atom, R stands for resonance, I stands for induction, and O stands for orbital. It pretty much describes your stability factors in the same fashion, where atom is going to look at the atomic size, R is going to look at the resonance, I is going to uh, look at the induction and O is going to look at the orbital from the hybridization perspective and electronegativity. Well, are you ready for some practice questions now? Go ahead and grab your textbook or head to organicchemistrytutor.com for some practice material and let me know how it goes. Also, any questions, comments or feedback, let me know in the comments below and I'll see you in the next video.